So it's a pleasure to, to be here with you, Bill, and, uh, you. and looking forward to, uh, to our conversation on, on the carbon market. So why don't we just start at the beginning? Why don't you tell us a little bit about the carbon market and how that connects to agriculture? Absolutely. So, um, you know, we get this question a lot, where's all this demand coming from? And um, the way, you know, you've all probably seen it. A lot of companies out there are making net zero claims or emissions reduction claims. The idea is that agricultural lands can be a big sink for carbon. Farmers can implement practices that increase their uh, soil carbon sequestration. If they provide historical data and ongoing management data, the impact of those practices can be quantified, and that can be turned into a carbon credit, which can then be sold, and um, the buyers of these companies who are making these claims can use those to, against their emissions reduction goals, to work towards that net zero, that carbon neutral um, aspirational targets they've set for themselves, um, many in, you know, even as soon as the 2030s. Okay, well, you've packed a lot into that answer. Let's try to unpack pack some of that. So, first of all, why Corteva? Why is Corteva in this space? You do so many other things. Um, what's the connection there? Absolutely. So, these buyers are not looking to make small purchases of credits. Um, to reach their goals, they're, they're wanting to buy hundreds of thousands of tons of carbon. Um, no one farmer is really positioned to be able to do that today. So with our network of customers and our, our reach, what, what we can do as Corteva is connect a bunch of fragmented supply and help, and help uh, you know, enroll a large group of farmers in a program that can generate an amount of credit, credits that can be sold to these buyers in the amounts that they're looking for. Now, when we think about what's most important to us is what we can do for our customers, um, this is a complex space and it's one that is difficult to understand, it's difficult to find a source of truth, things are, things are changing every day. So as Corteva, we're thinking about how can, we, how can we simplify the understanding of what's going on, how can we reduce barriers to participation in it through making the, the data entry experience for farmers more simple, and how can we be there like we are with our, you know, our core products and services as an advisor, as someone who can help them implement the practice changes and help them with the agronomy behind what's required of them to participate. And that's the, I think, our, our biggest, um, you know, the thing we anchor to is it needs to make sense for the farmer um, from an agronomic standpoint. And we're positioned um, with our reach and with our technology and our relationships to be able to help them through that. Great. So you mentioned agronomy, and that sort of leads to a question of, um, is there something particularly good about farmland that suggests that this is a really productive exchange? Well, yeah, and Chris this morning did a great job of talking about how it's an opportunity today to make an impact um, from a climate standpoint. A lot of these, uh, the companies that are making emissions reductions claims um, need to first and foremost be investing in technologies that reduce emissions from their own operations and supply chains, but um, all this land in the, in the U.S. that what we're talking about now can be a sink for it today, and the, the practices that do that are, are known. Um, obviously, there's challenges that come with implementing them, but um, it's attractive because it's a way to help companies make an impact now from a climate standpoint and bring new, uh, new revenue and new dollars into the, um, the ag industry and to farmers. So... Maybe it would be good just to spell out exactly what the market is, supply and demand. Who, who are both sides of this uh, equation? Right. So um, when we think about in the context of ag carbon markets, um, supply really comes from uh, programs like ours, like others who are, are rounding up um, and enrolling farmers and generating large amounts of, of tons of carbon credits in ag lands um, that are then purchased by... Uh, buyers from in and inside and outside of the, the ag industry. Um, a lot of the buyers are motivated because ag is within their supply shed. So by making these investments, they're able to reduce the carbon footprint of their direct supply chain. Then you have companies from outside of the ag industry, like airlines, who are looking to buy offsets to, um, to go against the unavoidable emissions of doing business for them. So... Um, for the context of this conversation, it's, it's farmers in, in ag, um, ag systems, and buyers could be from within the ag 
industry or, or, or from outside of it. Thank you. So um, as always, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to, uh, to raise your hand. Um, we've got plenty of time for, for questions. So if this is a new topic for you or a new possible source of income, um, please feel free to, uh, to, to stand up and be counted. And while you're thinking about that, um, so we've got the supply and demand side that you laid out so nicely. Um, where does Corteva fit in? What's the business model for Corteva in this? Absolutely. So, so I mentioned all the ways that um, we think it allows us to be another, um, uh, we're supporting farmers, you know, through the practice adoption, through the education on the practice changes themselves from an agronomic standpoint, um, and through um, just deepening the relationship with our customers. But when we think about how we structure our programs, we position ourselves to be sitting on the same side of the table as the farmer. Our programs are outcomes based. So the success of the farmer um, dictates how, with the, their practice implementation, um, dictates the success and how much carbon uh, revenue they can generate. Um, we tie ourselves to the success of the farmer. So the idea is that you know right now a carbon, a, a farmer generates carbon credits. Those are sold and, and revenue, the, the lion's share of the revenue goes to the farmer. Um, Corteva uh, retains a small portion of that to cover program fees today. Um, with the hope that as you know, the carbon market develops, prices increase, we're able to capture some of that upside with the farmer as well. Question? Thanks. Alex Sheline, uh, UIUC. So if uh, there's balance between supply and demand uh, prices are stable. If there's more demand, the prices go up and of course the reverse. So from where you see it right now, is uh, are carbon credits in surplus or uh, are there, is there more demand for uh, carbon credits than farmers can currently fulfill? Where is that looking? Today, demand is greatly outpacing supply. Um, there is a, you know, you, if anyone paying attention to the space or seeing new carbon programs being stood up um, from new entrants to the ag industry or some of the historical players, that's in response to how much demand there is for these. Um, like I mentioned, it's because it's something that corporations can invest in today to reduce or uh, reduce improve their emissions reductions claims. So there's a lot of demand for it, but um, the programs that a lot of them have begun, none of them are that far into it to where we're, we're churning out a large quantity of, of ag carbon credits yet. Um, so today, way more demand than supply, which gives us, you know, tailwinds and, and hope that um, it's looking good that prices will be favor will be favorable in the years to come. But um, yeah. So Alex, that's good news for the group here, then, right? So, okay. So uh, the question I have is, uh, you said there are many companies, uh, Chris spoke this morning, and there are many companies in this carbon market, and, uh, and there are different um, techniques or uh, technologies that uh, farmers can implement to sequester carbon. So what is a carbon credit? Is it uniform across all those companies? So when you buy a carbon credit from, from a farmer, what is it that you, you're actually buying? Is, is it you know, if you introduce cover crops for uh, under no-till this many years, is it the same in Cortiva that it is for other companies? And uh, again, what, what if, could you elaborate a little bit of it? What is, what is the carbon credit? Sure. So for a, a registry verified carbon offset, that's going to be one metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. The reason that w everything is carbon dioxide equivalent is there's more than just carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas that can be accounted for, quantified, and turned into credits. They all have different greenhouse gas and warming um, properties and impacts to the climate. But if we're talking a program that measures both carbon, methane, and nitrous oxide, that methane and nitrous oxide impact would be converted to a carbon dioxide equivalent so that we're one standard unit or one standard uh, product, which is a carbon credit. Um, so that's for, for carbon offsets that are, are registry verified. Other questions? Hey, 
is every country in the world going to be held to the same standards and the same same output output levels and how did this originate and where is all this money coming from to pay people for all of these credits i'm not sure that you know there will be uh, any requirements or standards for companies to adhere to globally. It's going to depend on the country, the continent, and um, whatever policy is in place there. Um, in the, the EU, you tend to see, or, or there's, there, are, there are countries that do have more of a compliance, uh, carbon or emissions compliance for companies within them. Um, but in the U.S., what we're seeing is, is it looks like it's more, it's going to be a voluntary emissions reduction approach. Um, but regardless of the system, I, th I think there's, there's promise that for the foreseeable future, demand will continue to buy carbon offsets. And um, for ag, it's, it's a new opportunity, but offsets are not a, a new thing. So I think, um, you know, with the... The, the focus on climate change and um, how governments and organizations are looking to reduce emissions, um, it bodes well for, for this market being a near-term solution. But um, not able to say about um, regulations or, or required participation in them. Other questions? Hello, my name is Dr. Bianca Bailey and I'm the founder of AgriWater. We are building a mobile wastewater treatment system that turns animal wastewater into profit, clean water, organic fertilizer, and carbon credits. So I guess my question to you is, um, have you seen um, carbon offsets or carbon credits uh, associated with um, reducing the amount of methane and CO2 emissions from uh, agricultural wastewater? Yeah, so the, the, our program today primarily focuses on um, reduction in tillage and cover crops as the eligible practices to, to participate. Um, but, you know, there's a, there's a suite of other practices that, in theory, you could stack with those types of things that continue to drive, uh, make an impact. And the key will be, you know, we know of a lot of things you know, as, a, as an industry, like you mentioned, that can have a positive impact on emissions. Um, but the question, the key question is, can you measure that? Can you verify the impact it's making? If you can do those things, then you can model and measure for it and generate credits. That was my next question. What technology can you use to quantify your carbon emissions as it relates to the water and from my vantage point, not being an expert in the space, um, the models that are in play here, like the one that Chris mentioned this morning um, and the other carbon programs use, um, don't have as much historical data to be able to model for those. So I think credits for water quality or impacts from on emissions from improvements there, like you're talking about, are further out due to the, the maturity of the data sets available. Any of these models, in order to measure the outcome there, need to have peer-reviewed research and, and long-term studies to be able to say what those outcomes are going to be within the context of that system. Uh, there we go. Carry Bones Sound Agriculture. I'm curious what you see as drivers for adoption by growers. Uh, I'm aware that when programs initially started rolling out, there's and there probably still is a lot of confusion, uh, hesitancy, much like any change, um, a lot of people sitting on the sidelines waiting to know if it's really worth getting in. So are there new drivers that are causing farmers to get through that curve? Is, you know, fertilizer prices have anything to do with it, macro trends like that? Or will it come from proof of concept with growers getting payouts in their area? What do you see as the likely drivers of, of adoption? One of the things when we get in the conversation with farmers about adoption of the practice um, in the context of a carbon conversation is that you need to believe, the farmer needs to believe in the agronomy and of, and the impact it's going to make on their operation, and that within the context of their farm, it will work and it will be no regrets work. 
um, that if carbon, the carbon market is there or not, they aren't going to regret reducing their tillage or implementing cover crops because we try to talk through what is, you know, how do you define ROI? What are your goals for implementing these practices? If it's, you know, we, they shouldn't be chasing the carbon dollars for it. Now, carbon does provide an opportunity to offset some of the cost um, of doing those practices, but with where payments are today, um, you know, different for every farmer, so we can't, can't really say specifically, but um, it, they aren't um, at the levels where they're going to offset those costs. So we think carbon can be a tool in the toolbox to ease the adoption of practices, but we're also seeing um, activity from the USDA that looks like there's going to be um, money coming in for uh, sustainable practice adoption. Um, and that's something to keep a lookout for. So, so when you combine potential carbon revenue, potential opportunities for USDA funded programs, um, and then any other local initiatives, I know university extensions are generally, um, you know, pioneers in their area for adoption of these types of things. So it, it kind of takes a village to tip the needle there, but with carbon being a piece there. Um, I had a quick question for you. With sort of the issue that the supply of carbon credits aren't where the demand is at, and looking at ways to increase, do you see wetlands or other areas coming on board as new means of creating carbon credits and the policies around that? Could you clarify what you mean by creating carbon credits in wetlands? Using wetlands for um, sequestering carbon so that the credits can come off of the wetlands. If, you know, I'm not too familiar with what practices would be in play there or, or the practice change that one would make when managing those lands to, to create a carbon credit. But if you can prove, like what Chris mentioned this morning, that it's real, that it's additional, and that it's, it's permanent, um, those are kind of the and that you have data that can, that can prove the change you're making is going to have that outcome, then you know, those are, that's kind of the formula to being able to generate a credit. Um, so you know, it's, all, uh, it's all dependent on, is it gonna, are you going to have uptake? Is it a change that farmers or land managers in that system are, are willing to make? Um, and can you prove it? Um, you know, as the large um, companies are sort of hiring battalions of folks to go out and help farmers fill out the paperwork, um, how, how, do, how do multiple companies, um, what's the mechanism for one farmer, one credit, or one program, one credit? Um, why would a, how, I mean, couldn't a farmer get triple the credits for, by just working with three different companies? How does that work? So any, any agreement that a farmer signs to participate here is going to come with their signature that they're not going to use that acre for an equivalent, a different carbon program. Um, it's not permissible to stack, or, to, or to, it's not permissible to enroll the same acre in two carbon programs. So, um, you would have the farmer attestation if they enrolled in one of them that they're not doing that. Um, and then, you know, eventually it's, you know, we aren't there today, but eventually um, there, there should be mechanisms in place that can track those assets back to and, and trace them to ensure there's no double counting. So today, you know, if a farmer were to make that decision to try to do that, they'd be essentially, um, you know, in, uh, it'd be fraudulent activity on their part, and I don't, I don't know many that would would take that risk at this point today for uh, in uh, in pursuit of carbon revenue. <laughs> yeah, and, and if it really came down to it, um, if it really came down to it, a farmer does specify. The sh with a shapefile or a boundary, the fields they've enrolled, they do. they do. So that creates an audit trail that both programs in this scenario would have and be able to, to find that eventually. All right, yep. Uh, Eric Barnard uh, with Farmer's Risk. Uh, my question was actually um, prompted by Dr. Scott Irwin's tw uh, Twitter thread a, a couple days ago where he was posing the question of with the, the rising 
corn and soy markets right now, the conflict in Ukraine, the question around supply, should we take acres out of CRP uh, to meet that, that demand need? And my question really is, are you seeing with some of these uh, incredible prices that we're seeing in the cash markets and the futures markets right now, any decline in interest in, in carbon? Is that something that farmers may not be seeing as such a, a, a an interesting thing to investigate right now, given some of the, the, the prices that we're seeing? Yeah, I mean, with recent events, it's, it's hard to predict how, uh, you know, as that reverberates through um, what effect that's going to have on it. But when, we, when we're engaging with customers, again, we're, we're talking about practice changes that are, are changing the way they farm and, and that their motivation should be there um, to be doing that with carbon as kind of you know, a cherry on top or, or gravy. So we're more or less capturing um, and working with farmers who are already thinking about making this investment in their, in their soil and in their land and connecting them with a carbon opportunity that can get, connect them with more revenue on top of that. So I, I think it's, it's less often that we find someone who, you know, hears carbon, sprints towards the opportunity, and then learns about the, and then, it, and then decides, okay, I'm gonna implement these practices. They're generally already implemented, in, or they're already interested in making that investment. And to me, that interest, uh, just Bill speaking right now, um, seems like it, it wouldn't be as sensitive to the events you're, you're referencing. Hello, uh, Nathan Wells uh, from Accenture. I was just uh, curious about the supply and demand and um, what's the outlook on governance of the supply side of uh, carbon credits because you know, entire value chains, uh, emissions are gonna be audited. And I see a conundrum down the road if, if you know, plots as uh, the, the, the woman mentioned earlier are gonna be appended to a particular supply of credits. So if, if we have seeds that are moving on a train and then, or a farmer's plow moving, the energy demand for that and the emissions appended to that, how is the supply going to be governed when every part of the value chain is uh, gov um, audited? So climate accounting in general, I think, is making efforts to account for ag's inclusion in, in that. Um, we're at the point where these, the tracking needs to be all the way up the supply chain. Um, and for, for both, you know, raw materials and for, and for carbon in, in this case. So um, we're not where we need to be to, today um, from a, an accounting standpoint and a traceability standpoint. The GHG protocol um, is, you know, historically been one that's looked to, to spell out these types of rules, but even, even those types of bodies are, are issuing new guidance as it relates to ag carbon and um, companies scope one, two, and three emissions tracking. I think ag as a piece of scope three emissions tracking is a tricky one. Um, that's, that's, there's work being done to, to firm that up. When you think about an offset, um, offset credit though, that, that is generally, a, a, that is a unique uh, asset that um, is purchased and retired. So in, in an offset level carbon situation, there's, there's a, uh, there's a little bit more rigor in, in the offset market today. Okay, we've reached the end of our time. Bill, thank you very much for a very informative chat. It's a new area, a lot of moving parts, and I think you really helped clarify a lot of this for, for many of us here, so we thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you.